Ukraine has now seen six months of conflict, violence, alleged war crimes brought upon it. Here are just some of those key moments in the last six months to remind you of because there has been so much. A warning, you may find some of these images disturbing. Six months ago today, on February 24th, Vladimir Putin launched his invasion of Ukraine, ordering thousands of Russian troops to go in across to cross the border. On March 9th, Russian forces bombed a maternity and children's hospital in Mariupol, killing three people, including a child. Remember these devastating images. President Zelensky called the attack at the time proof of genocide. A week later, a Russian airstrike hit a theater, also in Mariupol, that was being used as a shelter for civilians. And they wanted to make sure that the Russians knew it was a shelter because painted on the grounds outside of the building, in giant Russian letters was the word children. Hundreds were killed in that attack. On the 1st of April, the world saw the first horrifying images of the massacre in Bucha, evidence of Russian forces executing several men, their bodies found lying in the streets. A mass grave with an untold number of people buried there. The atrocities sparked demands of war crimes investigations and much harsher sanctions on Russia. And while the number of civilian casualties is still unknown, the United Nations now estimates more than 10 million people have been forced to flee Ukraine since the war began. All of this in just the last six months. Joining me right now to discuss more is William Taylor. He's the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and retired General David Petraeus. He's, of course, a former CAA director and former head of U.S. Central Command. Thank you so much for being here on this day. I want to break this into three parts, if I could. Ukraine, Russia, and the NATO alliance. General, where is Ukraine six months in? And what are you watching for in the next six months? Well, Ukraine, I think, has seized this strategic initiative. Yes, they have lost. Uh, they've gone from 5% of Russian control of their territory to 20%. But of course, they won the Battle of Kyiv. Uh, Putin failed to topple President Zelensky. Putin's also watching nearly 4 million of his best and brightest leave his country. He's made NATO great again. He's done more for Ukrainian nationalism than any Ukrainian nationalist figure. Uh, so now Ukraine is poised, supported by the arsenals of democracy, the U.S. and the other NATO countries, uh, to perhaps go on the offensive, to launch a counteroffensive in the South in particular, uh, having again used these precision munitions to rush ammo dumps, fuel depots, headquarters, and even airfields uh, in Crimea, seeming to set conditions for what might follow. But the question is, can they now translate all of these arms and ammunition and support from the West uh, into meaningful tactical and then operational victories in the South. And that remains to be seen in the weeks and months that lie ahead. Absolutely. And Ambassador, on Russia, where is Russia six months in? What do you see changing there in the next six months with regard to, I mean, Fred Plett can lay it out. You can almost think that there isn't a war going on if you're in Russia right now. Well, you're right, Kate. Um, and President Putin would like there to be no mention of the war. He, in fact, is you can go to jail for calling it a war um, uh, in Russia. So he is uh, he's concerned. He's got problems there. He's got economic problems. His big problem um, is one of soldiers. Um, his his military has been beaten up, as General Petraeus said, uh, and as your reporter said, uh, uh, in the beginning of this war, they got the Russian military got really hammered. Um, and they are now in a grinding battle uh, back and forth, losing tens of thousands uh, of, of his troops. Uh, so President Putin has a problem on soldiers. So he's looking for, you know, Libyans or Syrians or North Koreans. Um, he's looking at the private side. He's looking at Wagner Group. Um, he's got a problem. And what that means is he has in a strain to mobilize that if he mobilizes, then he's got a political problem at home, Kate. So he's got economic problems, he's got military problems, and he's probably got political problems. And General, talk to me more about NATO in this equation. It has stayed united and it is getting bigger. That is one thing that we have seen in the six months of war. Does that sustain for another half a year? Well, certainly we hope so. And I tend to think so. Uh, there's great leadership at NATO. The Secretary General has stayed on longer. You see two very strategically important countries with very fine forces, albeit small ones, Finland and Sweden, wanting to join NATO after years of being neutral. 
Uh, and you see the alliance pulling together and helping Ukraine in just about every way that they possibly can. So in truth, no one has done more again to make NATO great again than Vladimir Putin. He's the greatest gift to NATO since the end of the Cold War. Ambassador, let me play actually something that the NATO Secretary General has said about what winter is going to mean for Ukraine's allies. Listen to this. Winter is coming and winter is going to be hard and NATO allies uh, across Europe and North America are paying a price uh, caused by uh, the sanctions, uh, caused by, of course, the brutal war of, uh, of, uh, of Russia against uh, Ukraine, increasing energy prices, inflation. But at the same time, we know that the price we have to pay if we don't support Ukraine uh, uh, can be much higher. Ambassador, what does a cold, long winter mean for continued support for Ukraine from Europe when, when, what, when we can be looking at serious energy shortages? Okay, this winter is going to be key. Um, if, the, if the Europeans can get through this winter, the Ukrainians can get through this winter. I mean, they've got, they got millions of Ukrainians going back home um, uh, to destroyed homes uh, in the middle of a tough winter. Ukraine has a, has a tough, tough winter. And they will be short of energy as well. That said, um, if the if the Europeans can get through this winter, um, then demand for Russian oil and gas will have peaked and will be on the way down. And that's going to have a big effect um, on President Putin's ability to pursue this war. So this this winter is going to be tough. It's going to take leadership. It's going to take leadership from NATO. It's going to take leadership from the European Union and, and European nations. It's going to take leadership here in the United States as well. And if we can, if we can hang on, if we can maintain the support for Ukraine, maintain the, the, con, uh, the uh, we're convinced that the Russians can be beaten, that they can lose, and the Ukrainians can win. That will get us through this next winter. And General, also just. The next phase on the battlefield, of course, is also, also this winter phase. What does, what does that mean in the battlefield? Well, first, I think there's a the late summer and fall phase, Kate, and that's where we should be looking to see, can Ukraine take back uh, the province, uh, the oblast, uh, Kherson, K-H-E-R-S-O-N, mm -hmm. in the south, and also all of the area of Kherson that is west of the Dnipro River. And Ukraine has been taking out the bridges that connect Russian troops that are west of the river with their uh, logistics support and so forth on the east of the river. They've done it quite impressively and seeming to set up the uh, counteroffensive that I discussed earlier to be isolating that part of the battlefield uh, so that they can take that back and then see if they can press on further into the south. Uh, that's going to be key. Then you'll see, I think, the onset of winter it's going to be very tough. Uh, depends, obviously, on how how really difficult this winter is uh, in the southern area. It may not be as difficult uh, as certainly it is in the north and the northeast. Uh, I think the fighting will continue, however. And the Ukrainians, of course, are also showing something here that is crucially important, and that is that they are generating forces. They're recruiting, training, equipping, organizing, uh, and then employing additional Ukrainian forces much more effectively and efficiently and impressively than are the Russians. As the ambassador mentioned, the Russians are struggling just to find replacements, much less to find organized, equipped, and trained units. It has been a remarkable thing to watch on so many levels. General, thank you so much. Ambassador, thank you so much as well. I really appreciate you being here today.